I think it's important to understand what makes a puzzle. In simple terms, a puzzle is a problem that has been solved, and the player must discover the solution to the puzzle. In one of the videos by Mark Brown from Game Maker's Toolkit, he explained the difference between discovering the solution and inventing a solution. What defines a puzzle is that a puzzle asks the player to discover the solution, not invent one. With that, we understand the best part of a puzzle is not about finding the most efficient solution, but it is the moment when we discover the solution that works. The feeling of joy when something is finally solved. An aha moment. Kind of like programming, I guess. So how would we utilize this knowledge to help us create a puzzle? Well, here is how I create a simple puzzle in my game. Step 1. Identify the problem. Like all puzzles, there needs to be a problem that asks the player for the solution. We can think of a problem by looking at real-world references or brainstorm one on our own. The tricky part here is to figure out a way to alter these problems into a puzzle. You can't just expect any problems to turn itself into a puzzle without putting the effort. For example, you need clean water to shower. That's a problem, but not so much a puzzle. We will expand on this later in this video. Here we have a beginner puzzle in Tower of Chambers. When the player first enters the room, they are presented with a problem. In this case, the problem is to find the correct digits to unlock the door. Right away, we have introduced to the player what needs to be solved, and it is up to them to discover the solution. Step 2. Have a solution. Like all puzzles, there needs to be a defined solution. Take a look at the problem we've created in step 1. In this case, we have a digital lock that requires digits. We can define here how many digits the player needs and what those digits are. The solution in this particular puzzle is to literally find out all the digits presented in this room. After that, you enter them into the digital lock to unlock the door. It is a simple solution to a simple problem. I won't explain how these cubes allow the player to find the correct digits, but Feel free to leave a comment below if you think you have the answer to it. Don't worry about spoilers, because this is just a tutorial puzzle. Step 3. Set limitations. If you have an endless solution, that becomes problem solving again, not puzzle solving. So by setting boundaries and limiting the possible solution, we're a step closer to creating a puzzle. Remember the shower example I talked about earlier? Well, it turns out, by adding literal boundaries and limitation to what the players can do in the game, we've essentially turned a real world problem into a puzzle game. This game is called Where's My Water? And if you take a step back and replace needing water in the shower to needing a rake in the lake, you get Untitled Goose Game. Both games have limitation to what the players can and cannot do within the boundaries, and both games are fun and creative puzzle games on its own. Back to the digital lock in Tower of Chambers. The players are bound by the walls in this room, with no information outside these walls that are important to solving the puzzle here. 
the players are limited to the cubes presented to them. Of course, you can also have the players search through desks, drawers, or whatever you can think of. But in my case, it is these cubes. On the cubes, they find symbols they need to decipher to receive the correct keys to enter. The players know they need digits, and so they must use these symbols to figure out the correct digits. Step four: Add more layers to the problem. To make a puzzle interesting and a lot less like a series of instructions, one can add more layers to the problem. Having the cubes with symbols laid out on the ground, we've provided a single layer problems for the player. However, if we place more cubes in the room, we've then added another layer to the problem. These extra cubes ask the player to think more carefully than simply to look at all the cubes for the digits. By providing an extra layer to the problem, we made discovering the solution more difficult as a cost. So keep in mind how many layers to add to a problem. Every layer adds a slight amount of difficulty. There are many ways you can help adjust the difficulty after adding an extra layer. And that is to offer some form of help. In my case, Model 5HRP is here to offer some insight. For other games, it can be co-op, or hints on the wall, or messages on the ground. Oftentimes, one will have to repeat step one to three a few times before they can reach step four. These are all the steps required to create a simple puzzle in a 3D space. Let's apply this knowledge right now and create a puzzle using exactly what has been taught in this video. I'll begin with a new scene in Unity. I'll create a basic room with a few walls and a door. Step one, according to this video, is to identify the problem. I'll keep the puzzle relatively simple for time's sake. So let's just say the problem here is to cross over a gap to progress forward. Of course, just having a gap that's impossible to cross is not really a puzzle, nor is it very fun. So we'll provide a temporary solution. Let's add a bridge that the player can walk across. Okay, this is too easy now, and again, not very fun. The problem has no layers to it. Let's add a single layer to this problem by setting a limitation. This moves us along to step three. The bridge is cut short into half the length of the gap. The players can still try to walk across, but they are simply unable to do so this time around. If we leave the puzzle at this state, it becomes unsolvable again because a new problem arises, that of which the player cannot reach the bridge. This puts us back to step two. We need a solution for a new problem. And in this case, I decided to have the player control the rotation of the bridge. Where the player looks, the bridge follows. This way, the player can definitely reach across. However, the limitation the player now has is that they cannot stop rotating the bridge whenever they want. We didn't need to set a new limitation this time around because it came along with our new solution. Pause the video here if you want to figure out how players might overcome this limitation and solve the puzzle. The player can rotate the bridge and possibly to a rotation that allows the player to walk across. The catch here is the player cannot stop the bridge from rotating whenever they want. How do you go about solving this puzzle? Well, the player needs to walk backwards onto the platform and turn around once they're at the center. Once you figure that out, the puzzle is quite simple. What about the last step we mentioned now that our puzzle is complete? There are many ways to go about adding more layers, but I decided to add an extra beam that rotates on its own. This prevents the player from simply walking backwards. They must now think of a new way to approach this problem. The solution here is to remember how long it takes for the beam to rotate around. If we can remember when it will block our path, we can make our moves accordingly. If you enjoyed this week's episode, be sure to like and subscribe. It means a lot to me. And thanks for watching.